All right, let's get our Facebook groups in here for it's officially time to start the show. And ready for Scott to start singing the Muppets in the background here. Yep, it's uh, there we go, everybody. Welcome in, welcome in. It is Tuesday night, the 5th of December, and it's time for an episode of Building the Broncos. I am Nick Kendall and joined by typically always uh, Carl Dummer. Carl, I've been gone for two weeks, uh, baby classes. I got another one at six, so we need to be on the clock uh, today getting out of here. But uh, th- th- luckily that one's virtual. But uh, how are you, man? What's new? The beard is uh, full grown. It's back in here. What's going on? Yeah, no, doing well. Um, just kind of cruising along here. We got vacation coming up for my family this next week. So next week, there'll be somebody in my spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick and I, you know, our schedules seem to do this every once in a while where we're like a month. Seems like we don't get to see each other. But uh, but no, things are good. Uh, I had a good weekend other than the Broncos losing. And I, I was very fortunate. I, I had something going on, so I missed the game. So I, I got to take a little bit of the emotion out of it to, to mm-hmm. go back and watch it. And it still hurts. It still stings yeah. to see that. A game that they really, just so many things that should have won that game for them. You know, a lot of things went bad, but all the opportunities missed. And, and we'll talk about it a lot tonight. But uh, but yeah, and otherwise, life is life is good. Life's cruising along. How's, uh, how's everything going with baby? And Busy man, busy painted the nursery, set up all these different little furniture things. Got a rocking chair glider coming in tomorrow, and uh, finally bought a new car uh, as well. So excited about that! Uh, thank you to the super chatters in here. Now that's uh, a <laughs> pay, pay for the insurance, maybe one month, but appreciate everybody coming in. And speaking of super chatters, Troy Boer coming in and says, Hey guys, I don't know what to expect this week. Obviously, as the Broncos head to the Chargers, uh, Los Angeles. I hope we come out and dominate on the ground, hit the big pass plays we missed last week, and get four to five sacks again. Keep it going, defensive line. Have a great show. Well, it's off to a good start when guys like Troy are coming in here and donating uh, $10 Super Chats like that. So really do appreciate you, Troy. Hope you're doing well. And uh, always really love seeing the uh, the doggo and the deer in the uh, profile picture there as well. So hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope the holiday season's going well for you as well. Good to see you, Troy. David Youngkins in the house. at evening, everyone. Kevin Gregg, evening, Nick Carl and Scott Big Mile High salute. Uh, good to see you. We got Dylan in the house, of course. He says, Sup, Broncos Country. Make sure you guys hit that like button on the way in. Share on all your platforms and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much, Dylan. Always appreciate that shout out there. I see Kevin Gray comes in and says, I'm not upset with the loss. The offensive line needs to work hard on their pass blocking. Uh, technically, did the defense did great against the run. Secondary kind of had a down night. We'll get in. I guess we might as well just get a little bit into this Texans game. Uh, as we say hello to people and uh, everybody, make sure you're clicking a thumbs up on the way in. I had a chance to talk about it yesterday morning and this morning as well, but Broncos kind of went down how the Texans have taken down everybody this season. Uh, they were not super efficient. They didn't run the ball well. This is the tech- Texans. Uh, and they hit some explosive pl- pass plays, and that was enough. Honestly, Carl, you mentioned taking the you know, the emotion out of the game because you didn't see it during it actually happening. Uh, I was probably as invested in this game. It's good. The Broncos are good again because it's fun to be emotional about that. But I'm definitely a different person when the game is actually happening versus <laughs> after the fact. The switch yeah. goes on and off there. Uh, but I think that the Broncos were a little bit fortunate to be in this game, given a lot of the data. I mean, it was 13 to three after the first half. But what did the Texans have like nearly 300 yards in the first half of that game, uh, the Broncos did it pretty well to limit them after those explosive. It's crazy to have 50 plus yard receptions that don't go for touchdowns. Uh, so did that have happen twice? And uh, yeah, overall, I think that all well, the Broncos, you know, it was a close game at the end. You went 0 for 11 on third down. You lost the turnover battle by three. Your starting field position was the worst it's been, I think, since week four five this se- this season so uh, average starting field position so a lot of parameters uh, for the broncos which suggest that they shouldn't be in it maybe that's a positive uh, that they still were in it. obviously not a res- loss in the end but uh they i think they were fortunate to have a chance uh, at the end of this game when the texans i think missed some opportunities to really put it away yeah i, I guess i mean this and that's a two-way street mm-hmm. where yeah, russell missile missed i don't know how many four or five wide open jerry judy touchdowns yeah, I mean, they would have been touchdowns yeah. or at least very, very close to being them. And and so, yeah, I guess in some ways you could say Houston's a little bit lucky that he missed these wide open guys mm-hmm. that that would have probably put the Broncos ahead in this one. Um, the other one is that big fumble that five Broncos around it and somehow they don't come up with it. Yeah. That would have had them in Houston's 
side of the field and giving them a real good chance to go take the lead at that point. Um, you know, those kind of bounces in the five game stretch, they bounce into the Broncos arms. Mm -hmm. And this is why, unfortunately you you've talked about it before. Turnovers are a a difficult thing. Yeah. They they just, it's hard to keep those going week in week out and especially fumbles, you know, interceptions, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit different, but even there, there's sometimes those bounces happen to be, you know, off a receiver's hands, go right to your, your player you know, PJ Locke dropped one, an interception um, that they'd been catching before. That fumble mm-hmm. recovery that, like I said, would have had them in the zone. Just a few things that were not going the Broncos' way that they were during that five-game stretch. So it doesn't have me completely all that worried about this team because Houston's a good team. It was on oh, the yeah. road. And and like I said, Broncos missed some opportunities. And I honestly, I kind of appreciated Sean Payton calling out Russell Wilson in this one. What like, do you mean by that? Expand yeah, on that. But so I don't have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. So the, the day after when he's doing his press conference and they've had some time to go back and review the tape, um, Sean Payton talked about that. There were these plays that were there. Like there were open opportunities that, that were missed by the offense. He didn't flat out say Russell Wilson didn't throw it to the open receiver, but it, it's pretty easy to see who he's talking about. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where, <sighs> I've appreciated that he's not always had kid gloves with Russell Wilson because a lot of coaches throughout his career have had kid gloves with him. And I think sometimes it's led to where he makes a lot of the same mistakes over and over again. Like pretty much Russell Wilson has been the same quarterback almost his entire career. There's not a whole lot of big differences from second, third year Russell Wilson, other than he was a better runner back then. Yes. To, to what he's doing now. Like he still makes the same mistakes that he made back then still has the same weaknesses that he had back then. And part of me thinks a little bit of that is because coaches just didn't push him to grow in those areas of weakness. Like you would hope. And, and, and part of it's just, I think Russ is just, he's just Russ, (laughs) but he's just going to be who he's going to be and uh, nothing against that. And, but again, just, these are the kind of things that separate your being able to go for a championship and compete with really good teams or possibly being knocked out of the playoffs. So, um, yeah, I, I just uh, I'm not a not a big, big fan of that. Or I'm a big fan of getting him getting called out. And hopefully you can see some of that get worked on. And uh, but I will say something that does not need to be worked on is Little Caesars Pizza. Absolutely. All right, everybody, I want to make sure that you know to to make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor of the NFL part of your game day. Now, for me, you know, Sundays, most Sundays, not this last Sunday, but most Sundays get together with a group of people. I usually have like our youth group kids come over. And of course, the easiest thing to feed those kids is pizza. So ordering some Little Caesars pizza, it's always the right way to go. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sundays and get ready for some football fun. Yeah, choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way you win. And Little Caesars, I I always was a big fan of this growing up, and I'm so happy that they have this now. Stuffed crazy crust. The the stuffed crust with that mozzarella that you pull it out and just like stringy there. The more cheese, the better. I'm a Midwesterner. I'm not a Wisconsinite, uh, but I appreciate the more cheese you can have the better. And with the crazy crust, obviously the stuffed crazy crust with pepperoni. Oh, so good, man. It's, that's probably my favorite. Uh, so make sure you guys uh, are checking them out. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery on our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during games this week. So let's say hello to some more folks in here. Uh, Carl, I, I actually pivot back real quick. So Russell Wilson, I do think that he's been a, there's been like a renaissance of Russell Wilson of sorts from the early Wilson to what we saw in that like 2018 to 2020 era where he did become a little bit more pocket cerebral oriented versus, you know, a chaos merchant, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but and I agree with you that I do like Sean Payton, not directly saying Wilson by name, but, you know, putting blame on the quarterback. This is something we talked about. You needed a coach in here who had enough you know, skins on the wall, as we said a lot that you could come in here and say, yeah, that was not good enough from the quarterback. I don't want to. And I feel like sometimes specifically just speaking for myself can be pretty harsh or critical of Wilson. He's been good this season. I mean, he's probably somewhere in the 10 to 16th best quarterback in the league based on advanced metrics and my own eye test. Uh, But 
you know, he's been good. It's just some of the stuff when you are good, there are things you're leaving on the field and there were plays he left on field in this one uh, that obviously would have been nice and might've made a difference here. And uh, Sean Payton being frustrated about that, I think is a, a good thing, not just because, you know, calling out Wilson just to call out Wilson, but having the ability to do that. And also based on what we've seen from Wilson this season, I think he is receptive to it as well. I mean, there was the whole yeah. weird Seattle thing where let Russ cook. He doesn't want to be this Russ ball quarterback where, uh, you know, you're running the ball more than you're passing it. Uh, he wanted to be Drew Brees, a high volume guy, quick pass game, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we've seen from the head coach who did things with Drew Brees that Russell Wilson is not Drew Brees. He's not playing in that way. That's not the style. It's similarly stylistically from what we've always seen uh, from Russell Wilson. Obviously a few tidbits different here or there, uh, but the overall tenants of what Russ Ball is or a Russ offense is similar and more or less uh, the Broncos are working it pretty well. There are deficiencies, but there are also exceptional things that he does. Uh, some of the touchdown passes he has, some of the big throws down the field. I mean, those are S tier. Uh, so don't want to leave. Don't want to be too harsh without also being positive about it too. Uh, but it's the show right now. It's what we have with these five game sample size. And hopefully we can uh, do enough down the stretch here. Michael Ronquillo coming in, helping us do better down the stretch says good evening, Nick Carl and building the Broncos go Broncos. Good to see you, Michael. We really do appreciate you coming in and always being positive, a good force, uh, of course. And we got the old man. Uh, I guess I'm going to be the old man here soon. Darren Kendall. Hey pops. I said, sorry guys. I was bummed with the loss. They had opportunities for the win. They certainly did, but you go 0 for 11 on third down. You go, you give up that many yards. You lose the explosive pit play battle, which was essentially the one thing you could not do um, against the Texans because they've been terrible in success rate. But I think second in explosive passes this season, unfortunately, miscommunications on the back end uh, led to some explosives and Nico Collins almost went up for 200 yards. Uh, Fabian Moreau kind of, we'll come, I guess we'll get back. We'll leave that in a category maybe for later, uh, but you saw some regression there. No doubt. It was a bummer. I think the biggest bummer for me is not the overall losing to Houston. It's part of it, but it was the missed opportunity uh, that you had losing to Houston. You had the Steelers lose to the Cardinals. You had the Browns lose. You could have had Houston lose there at the end. And with the way the Sunday played out, the Broncos win that game against Houston. You give yourself so much of a buffer down the stretch. I mean, you, in theory, you could go three and two and make the playoffs still. So it is a, uh, it is a bummer, no doubt, but hopefully be better. Also the chiefs lost as well. I mean, heck yeah, you'd be one game out of the flipping AFC West. If you had that one. So missed opportunity. I mean, that's kind of how it feels about a lot of the games. I don't, feel like this is as big of a missed opportunity as, you know, losing to the commanders earlier this season, losing to the Raiders on a missed kick, losing to the damn Jets. God, that, I mean, those hurt more than losing on the road to a tough one in Houston. Right. Uh, but with all the circumstances surrounding week 13, man, the playoffs would have been in your hand. Now, it's not impossible, uh, but it is pretty darn hard. You have to go four and one, and even then, not a guarantee to make the playoffs. Guarantee, though, I want to say hello to Patrick coming here saying aloha, gents. Patrick, uh, of course, representing Lion Coffee Company, the unofficial sponsor of my mornings. Maybe the official sponsor of my mornings. I don't know. Uh, but they just opened a bag of the uh, macadamia and vanilla roast beans. And, man, those uh, <laughs> those are so good. Uh, so shout out to you, Patrick. Make sure you guys are checking out Lion Coffee Company. Malcolm Brown in here as well saying hello from Homer, Alaska. Hello to you, Malcolm. I guess I was complaining about the big, dark out here in Seattle as we're having the 4 p.m. sunsets now, but I can't even imagine how dark it is out there in Alaska. So I hope you're doing well. Hopefully uh, we're bringing a little bit of light to you as uh, we're uh, approaching the winter solstice, uh, of course. And I see some uh, comments here. Congrats on the newborn, Nick, et cetera, et cetera. Not here yet. Uh, On the way. Should be here in five to seven weeks. We'll see. I mean, time flying. Uh, Nursery painted. Things are coming together. But uh, yeah, I don't know if you're ever ready until it actually happens. I can't speak to it though. You guys can, I guess I'm the last one in this group uh, joining the fatherhood club. Yeah, it, it's uh, I mean, every journey is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I, I remember my like real moment of welcome to parenthood is a couple of weeks after bringing our daughter home and uh, she was a little colicky and just wouldn't just couldn't stop crying. Mm-hmm. And it's like 2 AM. And uh, my wife's like, Hey, do you think there's any way that you could run to Walmart? And we like Walmart's like 35 minutes away from us and uh, go get that colicky medicine. And I, I'll tell you that stuff, it really doesn't work, but you know, it's one of those things like it's at least we're trying something. Yeah. And I looked at my wife. I'm like, yep, I'm on my way. And so I got like these great husband points because 
I went to Colby, but in my mind, I'm going, I just want to get away from the crying. <laughs> that's why, that's so, why I take the last two weeks off, Carl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that was kind of my coming to parenthood of, oh my gosh, they really do. They just cry. Um, uh, thankfully, our daughter wasn't too bad compared to what I've had some other friends say on some things. But uh, no, I mean, it's great. I love it. It's terrifying. It's amazing. You know, my son all the time telling me stupid jokes. You know, I get the, guess what? And I'll say, what? Chicken butt. And then he runs and laughs. And, you know, I get those all the time. So, yeah, it, it is cool. I love every moment of it. But anyway, wait. back to back to football here. Back um, to football. Todd in the house. Hello, Broncos family and friends. Good to see you. We got Randy coming in saying, please, Denver Broncos must be strong defense. LA Chargers and Denver Broncos need to win and beat the Chargers this week. Go Broncos and go. Amen. Good to see you, Randy. Hope you're doing well. We got our guy, David McElrath, Papa Bear. Uh, good to see us as good evening Broncos country, Nick, Carl, Dylan, and Deacon Scott, hashtag 11 and six hashtag Buckham three times hashtag MHH for life and hashtag Denver Broncos for life. I feel like David was on that 11 and six, like back when the Broncos were one and five, he was mm -hmm. still allowing them to have a, a, another loss in there. So, I mean, I was like, ah, we'll, we'll believe it when I see it, but Hey, anything's possible now. I mean, gosh, that's, that's it, the NFL, man. If it happens, he becomes our local prophet. Absolutely. I want to give a shout to this guy, Ernie Mays Broncos country only. Hello, Ernie only, and uh, hello, Nick, Carl, and go Broncos country. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well, Royce, and congrats on the new car. Yeah, I joined the, uh, you can make fun of me, but the Prius Club got a good deal on it. So, uh, you know, it is something to hold some value. Sistos says, congrats on the new horn fatherhood, uh, newborn father. It's amazing. I'm excited for it. Had a good old man to show me as well. Hey, dad. Hey, again. Uh, and uh, Carl, I just wanted to get into it here with the Broncos in this game because still reviewing it, stock up and stock down. Um, for me, my biggest, I'm going to go an overarching one here on this one. Uh, so it's a little bit cheating and we can get into some individual players as well. But I just wrote an article about it that Chad posted today, but stock up for me big time from the Broncos run defense. Uh, this was a game that the Broncos, I mean, we'll just get into some of the data. The Broncos had been on paper and according to some of the advanced analytics, one of the better run defenses in the NFL since week six. So since the defense pulled their head out of their, you know what? Uh, and Denver, I think was like ninth in EPA per rush, uh, not great in success rate, but ninth in EPA per rush. However, that was very much inflated by turnovers to the extent that probably an outlier, the difference between entering last week's game, the difference between the Broncos EPA per rush defensive EPA per rush and the giants at number two was same as the difference between the giants and the team at 27 overall. So almost the entire, the Broncos, here's the Broncos, here's the rest of the entire freaking league. The EPA gained off of turnovers. When you when you remove turnovers, which a lot of times football analysts do because, again, turnovers are fluky, uh, that the Broncos then, I think, ended up at 28th in EPA per rush and 31st in success rate. So a defense that was getting a lot of bonus from recovering fumbles, not something sustainable, and on the at a deeper level, signs of concern. Not so in this Houston game, man. Broncos come in. I think they finish 10th or 9th in EPA per rush. I think they're about 10th or 9th in success rate. They force the Texans for on an average third down distance to go of over seven yards. I think it was about 7.2. And uh, the Broncos are able to get to a lot of third and longs and do some fun stuff on third downs with the pass rush. But you can't get to the fun stuff on third down with the pass rush unless you're doing the job on first and second down. So shout out to the Broncos interior defensive line. Shout out to their physicality. I know Houston wasn't a good run run team on offense overall, but they did their job. I mean, the Vikings were a putrid rushing offense when they came to Denver, and they ran over them like nothing in Denver in that Sunday night game. So really, I was so impressed with the the run defense, and it's not just the interior defensive line. Uh, Baron Browning, Jonathan Cooper, Alex Singleton. We can get to some of the individuals too, but I was that was my biggest positive takeaway from this game is that there is some life to the run defense. Yeah, I, they gave up one, I'd say one big run play that went for 22 yards. It was a first and 25. Mm -hmm. And they kind of went into a pretty deep defense and kind of broke one tackle, got got out there for a nice gain. Otherwise, like you said, contained them as well as we've seen all season. Um, you know, only gave up three yards per carry. I think, and, and it's not that the Texans didn't try to run. I mean, they, they had 30 carries in this game. They were trying to establish the run game and think, hey, this is the weakness of the Broncos. Let's do this. And like I said, people stepped up. Guys that we have called out on this show many times. Um, Jonathan Harris had himself probably his best game of the season. Mike Purcell 
another one that probably had his best game. Kind of the weird thing is the, the one guy that I was not that impressed with on the defensive line, DJ Jones. He was the one that I was kind of like, eh, for, for him, for what I expect from him. Mm -hmm. This was a down game for him. But everybody else on that defensive line, uh, that includes edge players. I, I thought that was pretty darn impressive what they were able to do. And talking about impressive, Mr. Phil McLaughlin coming in saying, good evening, Nick, Carl, and Deacon Scott. Gosh, just thinking hindsight, we beat the Texans, Chiefs lose, we beat the Chargers, Bills beat the Chiefs. Just imagine, does, but doesn't matter. This year is fun and it's been a long time. Hashtag Buckham, hashtag MHH for life, hashtag go Broncos. You know, as tough as it is, you know, like I said, this, this could have given the Broncos a huge advantage to go into this. I also kind of look, though, a lot of the teams that are ahead of them, uh, you know, Pittsburgh just lost their quarterback. So are they going to be able to hold on with their, their final part of their roster here? Uh, Jaguars will have to see what happens with Trevor Lawrence. I don't, I don't know with his ankle, how well he's going to be able to handle some things moving forward. Um, Colts kind of up and down this year. You know, they're, they're more up lately than they've been down, but still mm -hmm. they got their backup quarterback in there. We're gonna have to see what they can do. Um, so th there's a few teams that are ahead of them. Cleveland, I guess is another one. I had somebody send me their schedule the other day and they said, which game are they winning as the season progresses? I think they play Cincinnati. So I think that's a winnable game for them and maybe Pittsburgh again. So maybe there's a couple more games that they can win, but right now it's still very much up in the air. Who's going to be in that fifth, sixth, seventh spot for, for the playoffs, the divisions probably out of the question at this point, unfortunately, I mean, even though the Chiefs lost just the, those two games, it's going to be tough to overcome. Uh, we got Patrick coming in saying, question, gents, realistic expect expectations going forward, buck them all. I still think the Broncos can get to 10 and 7. I would, if that was the line that you were giving me and it was even odds on both sides, I would probably take the under still. I think it's probably most likely five games left. You're sitting that there at 500. It's an easier schedule, but you have really writing some almost unprecedented turnover streak there, especially the turnover ratio. Cause it wasn't just, you were taking it away. You weren't turning it over and that changed rather quickly versus Houston. So if you, if you gave me 10 and seven, I would probably take the under. I probably, I think done in my head, I'd say three and two down the stretch finishing nine and eight, which would be really just unfortunate. Cause I would probably have you just outside the playoffs. Uh, and I think three and two down the stretch and competitive in every game, is a realistic expectation. I don't think four and one and making the playoffs is, should be the expectation. Like if the Broncos come just short of that, it's going to be disappointing, but you came into the season. I mean, think about where we were at one and five to a uh, Sisto's uh, point here. He says at this point, uh, it's all good vibes for the rest of the year. They've been playing really well. And that's all I ever wanted from this team is to leave it out all in the field. Uh, I think that's probably the most realistic expectation from the team continue to improve. And, just further buying into what Sean Payton wants to do. And we'll be really curious to see how he works with George Payton, assuming he's back uh, to formulate this roster in year two of the Sean Payton era. Yeah, I, I guess I, part of it's just, I'm looking at their opponents, mm -hmm. um, you know, the chargers, they won a game six to zero. They against... always play Denver tough though, man. Uh, I, they I just... do. I, I'm not saying they don't, but I just six to zero against the worst team in football right now, I would say. I guess Carolina, I, I can't, can't fully take them out of the picture there. Um, but even to see that their offense struggled in mm -hmm. that one and to know that their defense has not obviously been playing all that great at all this year. No. Uh, so I, I think the Broncos, I, I hate to say, yes, they're going to win both of them, but I, I think they are. I really do. And I, I feel like because the, the Raiders are going to be out of it at the end of the season, I think the Broncos can go win that one as well. And so that's three games. So it kind of comes down to you got Detroit and you got New England. Obviously, I think you're going to beat New England. So Detroit, I mean, and I'm not trying to say that that would mean they go five and oh, um, that Detroit one's going to obviously be very, very tough on the road. Great team right now. You know, it, it's kind of weird. There's kind of this cutoff in the NFL. Uh, there's about like three teams in each conference that are really good. And then everybody else. And Detroit's like right on that edge of being in that upper tier group they're not quite there but they're they're right there and so i have a hard time seeing the broncos win that one 
Um, but yeah. you're right. Those division games, it's hard to always say. Like I say, hey, like looks like the Broncos are the better team, but it's still a division game. So you just never quite know. And just some, just to add on to that, because we're starting to turn the page to the Chargers uh, this Tuesday night, of course. But Denver is 0-3 in their history at SoFi Field, uh, which is weird because Chargers don't really fill up the stadium so well. There's a lot of orange. That's one reason I like orange, too. It just pops so much more in the stands. You know Broncos country is there. If they were yeah. Navy, it's kind of muted. Uh, but uh, that's just my opinion. Th- throw that one in there for the uh, orange agenda. But they're 0-3 in that, uh, in, in SoFi. One thing I think the Broncos have going for them in this one is you talked about it. You know, they they feel like they didn't put their best foot forward this last Sunday and they left opportunities on the field. I think they're going to be going into that Chargers game ticked off, man. I think they're going to go in there and want to be the bully again. I think they're going to try to replicate uh, what we saw versus the Browns in terms of the physicality running the game. And the Chargers are boo hockey against the run on bo- and running the football. So two areas that the Broncos have struggled with uh, so far this season, chargers just not good in the lines of scrimmage. I think the chargers do have the better quarterback. I asked Scott this morning, um, where, the, what would the Broncos record be if we flipped quarterbacks uh, with the chargers? He said probably two more wins right now, but uh, that's a, I think the Broncos should really outgun and outman the chargers in the line of scrimmage. And I think they're going to be playing ticked off i think they feel like they left that one on houston that they could have won and they're going to be focused and angry and they're going to take it out on the chargers who are just a soft team let's call it what they are they're a soft team if staley had been fired i'd be a lot more nervous about this game Mm -hmm. just seems like teams get that little bit of bump after a coach is fired you think about when hackett was fired last year all of a sudden the offense came out of nowhere started looking like it actually knew what it was doing and is it sophie or sophie SoFi. So did I say Sophie? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. They're not sponsoring <laughs> the show. So all right. We're calling it Sophie. Show, we'll, we'll get it right. I think um, they should be Sophie. If they pay us though, we're going to get it. Uh, that's all. I'll get it right for that. Uh, or if maybe we'll name it in uh mile high West, if they can finally get a win there. But yeah, I think the Broncos will be able to out physical the chargers. And uh, that's one thing that third and long uh, should be good. Uh, hopefully for the Broncos, they struggle getting pressure with just four. Uh, but when you can get third and long, you can get a little more fun with your pressure packages. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing I've always loved about Vance Joseph. I think he has some of the better pressure packages in the league. You know, where he's sending that pressure from. And we saw it in this last one. Got home on a, a few occasions and and really made C.J. Stroud at least feel a little uncomfortable in that game. You know, he, he still made some incredible plays with pressure in his face. Man, yeah. seriously, like that kid, my... I have all the more respect for him as a quarterback, and I think he's going to be easily top three quarterback for a long time in this league. Houston, I mean, if, I was, if I was voting right now, I think I'd have him in my top five for the MVP this season, which is yeah. wild. But I mean, there's been so much down quarterback play and teams that really haven't lived up to it that, I mean, he's got to be in the conversation. Oh, yeah, easily. And I mean, what did he win? He won rookie of the month and offensive player of the month. As a rookie. So, um, no, he, he's he's a great player. Houston is set up so well for the next four or five years. I'd be surprised if they don't win a Super Bowl during that stretch. Um, looks like they have some pretty darn good coaching. Got some defensive playmakers. Stingley's out there looking like he's what he's supposed to be in the league. Um, Will Anderson, of course, they're on the defensive line getting pressure like crazy. Oh, my gosh. That guy just looks like a missile. He, he reminds me of early Von Miller. You know, just how he fires off the line, can win with power, can win with speed, all those kind of things. So if you're if you're a Houston fan listening, be happy. You are you are set up well. <laughs> My comparison for him was uh Khalil Mack, which is kind of ironic. They were going from one to the next, but he's not as bendy. He's I think is a little bit more stiff uh than Von Miller, where Von Miller could yeah, with everything going on, Von, I don't even want to say his name. I know. Uh but uh he could turn the corner under like run full speed under a coffee table where Mac was just, he's a little bit stiffer, but he was such a power player. And that's how Anderson plays as well. And I know I already said run defense stock up, Carl. I'm just going to keep chugging along here. Uh, stock down for me. I think he had been better recently, but this was a down game and even got called out by the coach. Uh, Sean Payton saying we need to give less uh, pressure and push on the right side. Mike McGlinchey major stock down, not a good game from the old Mikester on the right side of the line. I thought that overall, like I said, since, Packers game 
really. Uh, he had been playing better football, just not giving up pressure left and right. But this one, him and Bowles, I think, uh, struggled a lot, but most more so McGlinchey. And you, yeah. you hate to see it. I do wonder how much of it was game flow. Uh, the Broncos during their win streak, almost every game they led early and for like most of the game. Uh, and that allows you to be a little bit more conservative in terms of your pure dropback sets. Like the opposing team doesn't know that you're trying to play keep up, which means, you know, longer drops and more pressure uh, and onus on the offensive line to pass protect uh, because the guys can just pin their ears back on the other side. Then this is the game where you're behind early and often. And it meant that the Broncos were a little bit more desperate and the, you know, the deeper drops and everything like that from the quarterback. So harder from a glinchy that couldn't hide him as much because of that. And he got whipped uh, consistently. So hopefully a better game going forward. I don't think we will see, I guess we do have Max Crosby uh, coming at the end and Aiden Hutchinson too. But I mean, Will Anderson is probably a prospect talent wise, a, a step up from those guys. It's hard to say with Max Crosby. He's incredible. Uh, but uh, yeah, Scott doesn't agree. I mean, Anderson's pretty damn incredible too. So we'll yeah. see. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm a, uh, Big fan, but McGlinchey, bad game. Stock down for sure on that one. And I, I'll take back. I haven't seen what Scott even said in the comments yet. I'll take it back. Crosby's so good. Um, so I, I, I probably would put him over Hutchinson, uh, but Crosby's so damn good. So we'll, we'll pretend I didn't say that one. <laughs> yeah, I like Colin's comment saying, no pizza for Mike Yeah, after a game like that. You don't, you don't earn, you haven't earned your pizza at this point. Um, now, I know we've already kind of talked about the defense line. I, I wanted to give a shout out just to Zach Allen. You know, he has been that one consistent guy week in, week out as a dominating force. And he had himself another good game, got another sack, um, helped out in the run game. There's only like one play where I was just like, what are you doing? Where he was, he was supposed to kind of hold the edge, which I got, but the runner just kind of ran right by him. And he just kept staying right in that spot. I, I, get, I think he just didn't know where the ball was. Um, but beyond that, I thought he had himself another heck of a game looking like one of the better free agents the Broncos have signed here in a while. And so, so good to see that. Um, the bad, I mean, I, I guess I'll just throw out the, the obvious one of Russell Wilson. Um, just the offensive line didn't have their best game by any means, but there were still a lot of plays where he had plenty of time. There's times where he escaped the pocket when he didn't need to, missed a wide open receivers, under threw some receivers. I mean, another play we haven't even talked about. The, the Marvin Mims deep pass. Like Mims had like five yards of separation and underthrows him. And now we could question whether it was pass interference or not. Um, There's no question. It, it was pass interference. I get that. I, I guess part of me is in that if it's not completely blatantly obvious when it's especially an underthrown pass, I might bite the tongue there, bite the flag just a little bit. Don't bite um, any flags. Maybe yeah. swallow the whistle. Swall so there you good. go. Swallow the whistle. I would not bite any flags. You don't know what those have been. <laughs> but uh, but still, I mean, that, that's a touchdown. Mm -hmm. That's missed right there just because of an underthrown pass. And there, there's a few of those underthrown passes. And, and now his receivers didn't always help him out. Um, I know Sutton had a, an incredible catch for the touchdown. But he also dropped a couple passes that would have been big plays, especially early in the game. You know, I think it was – first offensive play of the game that did play action deep pass to Sutton over the middle and maybe just a little bit of a high pass, but still one that he had both hands on the ball that usually he comes down with second play. It was second play. Okay. Second play. And I just think about that of how does that change the game mm -hmm. where you get that momentum of, okay, you got a big play and uh, or no, I guess they went three and out in their first drive. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden you go and have a big play right off the bat. You're in scoring position. Like, how does that change the entire dynamic of that game to hit that one right off the bat? And so, um, again, it wasn't all on Russell Wilson for the offensive struggles, but this is definitely one that he's going to look back on and hopefully watch and just go, man, what was I doing? Like, I missed this guy, threw bad throw here, you know, all those kind of things. Like, it just there's a lot of things that went wrong for him in this one. And, and again, I, I'm not trying to take away from the rest of the season. He's had a lot of great plays, and part of this five-game win streak is Russell taking care of the football and getting the big plays when the Broncos need it. So um, he, he's been a big part of the win streak, but just not this one. Yeah. 
I, he did not finish with a great game. Uh, according to the advanced metrics, of course, uh, is a negative 0.24 EPA per play. Not great. Uh, his expected QBR uh, to 23.1 out of a hundred. I mean, that's, that's really, really low. Uh, he didn't have a good game now to be fair to him. I think that the first interception was not his fault. That was just a hell of a play by Will Anderson. Uh, almost like spinning the bullet. What was that movie wanted where they had the bullets curved when they shoot. Uh, but uh, that was an unbelievable play by Will Anderson. Anderson. Unfortunate. I do think that second interception, a lot of people thought it was just a great play by Derek Stingley. I don't know. It was an inverted, inverted cover two look. I think he should have been a little bit better with the placement on that one. Uh, and then obviously the, the third play, which Peyton kind of, I think Peyton was more upset about the process of getting to that play on that uh, third down interception to lose the game. Cause there was supposed to be somebody in motion and he blamed communication and curl, not a part of the read when it gets there. But uh, overall, I agree with you. This was a stock down from Wilson, especially because he had been uh, so trending in, in, in a solid direction. I was never, you know, Russell Wilson's the best ever look at the touchdown interception ratio, given the opportunities, the offense was being given, having far and away the best average field position in the NFL, not really taking advantage of those opportunities as well. Uh, but this was a game where the Broncos went up against one of the worst pass often pass defenses in the NFL. I think they came in 25th in EPA per play 24th in success rate. And the Broncos just did not look like a good passing team against them. Uh, you did mention the drop by Cortland Sutton there. Uh, there's a few other things. I mean, obviously the offensive line was getting beat left and right, but this is one where if Russell Wilson is a no doubt top 10 quarterback, you win this game. Uh, you, you, he doesn't miss Jerry Judy, or if he does, he makes up for it later. Uh, there's an argument still for, you know, top 10, but uh, that not a no doubt one without a doubt. So uh, I'm with you. It's stock down on this one for Wilson. He's still been fine this season. Trust the broader sample size. Uh, he's solid quarterback. They've been playing good. I think Sean has done well with him, even though it's still devolved into the same style that Wilson has played anywhere schematically. Uh, but overall stock down. Um, so I, I guess I'll go a stock up on this one. Uh, for me, I already kind of gave him a quick shout out, but he's somebody that, again, I think it's just a redemption story here on this one. I've been harsh on him this season because he's been poor. I think he was one of the worst players in the NFL entering this week and missed tackles. Uh, he, they paid him a solid contract. He has not lived up to it. And other than a play that Sean Payton seemed upset about where he got, uh, what did they say? Egged on, uh, trapped by it, by a rookie quarterback, uh, Alex Singleton, other than the personal foul, he had a hell of a game. Uh, he was flying around. He was bringing energy, the blitz where he timed it perfectly and just flew through that a gap and CJ Stroud didn't have a chance, uh, was great. Um, that was really fun to see. He was playing downhill. And he, again, he just brought an energy that I felt like we haven't seen from him. This season, I know he plays like a little bit, you know, reckless abandon, but it was it was controlled chaos and aggression. So I thought Singleton had a heck of a game, uh, and I did want to give him a shout out. Uh, I've, one of the, I think probably his best game of the season. Yeah. So, like I said, I, I was on the road when the game was going on, and I had it playing a little bit in the background when I first was driving, and the last play I listened to was the Singleton play where he got the penalty. Mm. Well, and I, I just, I felt at that moment, I'm like, this is not safe for me driving right now. Cause I'm just getting angry that he would make this stupid mistake and be this selfish on this kind of play. And I get like probably egged on probably should have been offsetting penalties, both sides getting after it and talking to each other and slamming helmets together and all those kind of things. But it's just one of those, you gotta be smart. Like you gotta understand, like this is a fourth down play. This is big. Hmm. You hold him here. Plus they had the false start penalty. So they're going to be fourth and seven, probably kicking a field goal. Instead, now they're getting seven points. And so you just added points into this game. And when it's, you know, two tight teams like this, that makes a big difference. You're right. The rest of the game, like I went now that I've actually watched the whole thing. There are some incredible plays that he makes. There's another one that just, I was laughing because he had an offensive lineman blocking him and he throws the offensive lineman into the running back and tackles him by throwing an offensive lineman at him. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that is just, it's beautiful to see that kind of power and just be showing up in that way. Um, something like you said, we haven't had here for a lot of this season, like defense has been great and there's been some great turnovers and all those kind of things, but to have that attitude. And so just finding that fine line between going too crazy and hurting your team and being there to go make a big explosive play on defense you know, like I said, you just got to figure out how to walk that line. And so 
actual play for the entire game, you're right. It's just hard to, for me not to look at that one play and look at you just lost by five points and you gave up seven because of that penalty. Yeah. So <laughs> that's my my one thing there that makes me a little bit hesitant to um, to get there. And, uh, and I think part of the stock up, though, is because he had been playing so poor in yeah. this that he was starting from down here uh, and I think he's, you know, really good. I mean, zero missed tackles in this game. PFF attributes him with uh, six run stops. So that's like where a guy like gets full credit uh, for the defensive stop, not just a gang tackle. It was on him and uh, seven tackles total with also getting that beautiful sack uh, that he had, not a manscaped ad folks. Uh, so uh, that was a uh, the really good game from Singleton. I think he has to be a stock up in this one. Uh, he was a big part of why the run defense did it. I, give a little bit more credit to the collective of the defensive line up front uh, for that. But Singleton had a heck of a game. And I even said during the game, he's got to lose his game check for being so dumb with that, that uh, personal foul penalty. It was dumb. I think Sean was probably reamed in to him uh, as well. Uh, but uh, that's something that again, stock up Singleton, good game. If you can continue to bring that energy and not miss the tackles and the run defense can be that good. You can kind of overcome some of your struggles with getting pressure with four. Yeah. I'll go PJ Locke as another stock up guy. Stock up, okay. You know, another guy that had a sack coming on a, a blitz there. Uh, another guy that had quite a few stops in the run game, three stops from the safety position coming down, helping out. Um, only gave up one catch in this game for five yards. And just, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, you you got in trouble a little last year by saying PJ Locke who? Uh, be, there was a day in like August where we, there was only eight questions asked and six of them were about PJ Locke. And I'm yeah. like, what the heck did I miss? <laughs> did he like save a baby in the, the practice today? Well, it's like, why? we're talking about a third string safety, but oh, uh, man. Denver Twitter awesome. came after you, man. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, he seems like a nice guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But no, I just, it's incredible to see his growth as a player, you know, to go from lock who to, mm -hmm. Hey, like this is a guy could be a part of your future. He's yeah. playing at that kind of level where he should, he's not only in because of an injury, he's in there because he deserves to be in there. Like I, I'm going to be very upset if um, when KJ comes back, if they put him back in there, I, I can't understand how in the world you could do that to him because he's, he's just uh, there's that old saying of getting Wally pipped. I think he's been Wally pipped at this point. And, and, I think he should be fine with it because I think this is probably his last year in the NFL. Uh, he's maybe got one more year, but I, I doubt he's going to want to go be a backup somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and so like I said, for the Broncos to finally find that true safety to go next to Justin Simmons. I, I'm excited for that safety pair. He's a free agent at the end of the year, isn't he? Is he a restricted free agent? I think they brought him back for like really low contract. I don't know if he is the no doubt uh, safety at the end of the season, especially if our guy Christian Parker uh, moves to a new spot as a defensive coordinator. I would be 0% shocked if uh, PJ Locke follows him, but I thought he was out there for a bit and then only one year contract brought back really cheap and uh, only a one year deal. So we'll You're see right. if he is the safety of the future. I would be happy to bring him back without a doubt. Uh, especially when you can get some dime package looks with Caden Stearns, assuming he can stay healthy, which can we assume? No, but uh, that's uh would like him back, but I am curious if it is a, this is just a stop for him and he's on to somewhere else next year. So. You're probably right. Uh, I mean, it's just because the Broncos with the, the salary cap situation, he is playing at a really high level. So some teams going to want to give him a lot of money. Like you said, if, um, if our, defensive backs coach moves on for, for another team, um, Parker. I'm sure that's going to be one of his guys that he's on the table, pound the table saying, get this guy here. Yeah. Um, you or know, maybe as your Evero as well, uh, wherever yeah. he's at <laughs> next season, but that's something to follow as well. Uh, I'd love that PJ lock back. Uh, one thing I will say, Carl, it's not for not, uh, it's not all, you know, he's definitely gone. Uh, he has not played a lot of games. He's had injuries himself. And he plays the safety position, which, let's be honest, you can find starter quality, average kind of guys for dirt cheap on one-year contracts every single offseason. Uh, so I'm not sure what the market demand will really be. Maybe he'll want to come back and play here again, play next to Justin Simmons, especially if he has a chance uh, to be a starter opposite him. But uh, 
we'll see what happens, but good shout PJ lock. I mean, I really love the, uh, the number six flying around. I'm so glad they're letting other players wear those single digits now. Cause it just pops more, especially for the defensive backs uh, when they're rocking those single digits, we need a really good Broncos receiver. That's wearing a single digit at some point. That'd be fun too. Uh, but uh, not there yet. Um, I think we got to go stock down again on this one for me. We already said McGlinchey, right? That was one that was mm-hmm. an obvious stock down. I'm gonna have to go Troutman as well. And just the tight end position in general for Denver. I love what Manhurts is doing, but let's be honest. He's a glorified six offensive lineman. Uh, and he went down in the game. I hope he's okay. I don't remember exactly hearing uh, what the status is with uh, Manhurts going forward, but uh, Adam Troutman, he is your snap leader at the tight end position. And just not getting it done. Uh, he's supposed to be, you know, your wide tight end and 11 personnel, and he's getting whipped in blocking assignments and you're not getting much from him in the past game after the catch. It just, he's kind of just a dude out there. Uh, and I know the Broncos were traded for him a fifth round pick or whatever it was at the draft. Uh, but I am hoping the Broncos can figure out something at the tight end position. Somebody who's a true Y tight end too, somebody that can play that inline guy in 11 personnel. Cause it's still your number one package that you use out there again brought to you by manscape uh but uh that is uh troutman's got to be a stock down for me he's been not very good uh for the broncos and i feel like an area that if you are further committing to russ this russ style of football you need the heavy personnel here so you need to be better in 12 and uh 22 so that's two tight ends on the field and you need a tight end who can do something after the catch because if it is this home run to check down offense, those checkdowns don't just have to be to running backs. They can also be to tight ends. And right now you're getting absolutely diddly squat um, from the tight end in terms of the playmaking and yak ability. All right. No, that, that's a good one. I, I like, and, and I agree with you. You know, we, we've talked about it before, just how pathetic the tight end position has been for the Broncos all year. It's been unfortunate that, Dulcich had to go down with injury. You know, what would he have been for this offense? What could he have brought as an explosive option for him? We won't know fully. I, I don't know if he'll – it sounds like he maybe will be back this week, next week. Might be activated this week. We'll see if he plays against the Chargers, though. All right, we got Phil coming in again saying, based on the way our cheap guys are playing, who is most, most likely gone next year? Also has the play of the rookies making George Payton's job safe. I wouldn't say the rookies because how much of this past draft class was Sean Payton compared to George Payton? You know, I look at what the Broncos did of trading up to go get Marvin Mims, trading up to go get Riley Moss. Those are Sean Payton kind of moves. Mm -hmm. George Payton's more of the, I want to trade back, get as many targets to throw at the board as I can. So to me, this was more of a Sean Payton pushed draft this last year. I would say you you look more at the the year two guys and a lot of them stepping up, the year three guys, you know, those are George Payton drafts. And um I I think some of those guys maybe have helped save his job. You know, you look at Nick Bonito um as, as one of those guys that I he's he's playing so much better than we thought he would bring to the Broncos. Um, I, I would say, uh, unfortunately, Dulcich, Mathis, not looking great. Um, Wattenberg can maybe, yeah, Ruzerik, <laughs> unfortunately, but of course, Patrick Sertan, great mm-hmm. draft. Javante Williams, another Quinn Miners, possibly going for all pro kind of level. Baron Browning looking like maybe the true number one rusher for the Broncos this season. Um, Jonathan Cooper. Coming out as a starter as well. So you look at that 2021 draft. That might be the one that helps save his his job. I don't know. I, I still, I don't know how their dynamic is between those two. It's hard to say, right? We just, we don't know what the inner, uh, inner workings are and who really have, we know Sean Payton's in charge, but to what extent compared to like the Walton Penner group. So uh, I would say that right now, just based on vibes, George Penner's job seems to be safe. Uh, but the Broncos, you know, fall off down the stretch and Sean Payton wants somebody else in there, then that might happen. But uh, I think a lot of it is the undrafted kind of low key signings as well. I mean, a lot, he was getting, you know, thumbs down from it earlier, but now maybe it looks like a thumbs up. The retaining of Cortland Sutton for the contract that they got him on looks pretty good right now. Another year of control also where you can uh, extend him and lower that cap hit next year. I think he's playing good enough that that's 
definitely a conversation for the Broncos. The Quinn Miners hit you talked about, the identifying of Jaquan McMillan, uh, PJ Locke. Those are undrafted free agents that the front office and the general manager should get credit for uh, as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of Jonathan Cooper, as you mentioned. So there's a lot of aspects of it as well. So right now I would say he's leaning towards being back, uh, but we still have five games to go. You know, it's the same thing. I have like right now I'm leaning with Russell Wilson being back, but five games to go. Things can change. Five games is not a insignificant sample size. Uh, so we will see. And uh, talk about seeing. We got our guy Naj in here. Naj, good to see you. He says, hey, brothers, I love Russ, but his performance this week was particularly worrisome. The underthrows to Sutton Mims, who was open by seven yards and completely missing Judy, who was open on at least five plays. What does Peyton do? I think Peyton leans into what we've seen uh, so far this season, even further so down the stretch here. And that is going to be an offense that is running the football almost three to two, three rushes to two dropbacks. And the Broncos will be one of the five lowest teams in pass ra- uh, pass rate over expected. So situations where teams would normally pass, Broncos are going to be running it. They are trying to not be a high volume passing game. They do not want to make Russ have to do too much in terms of the post snap processing here. They just want to simplify it and put them in good situations and play some ugly physical football, which my Midwest heart loves. Uh, So I think that's probably what Peyton does. Luckily for the Broncos, I think only one of their final five opponents has a good run defense. And that is the Patriots who have a phenomenal defense. Uh, but the Chargers, horrible run defense. The, the Lions have been like dreadful on defense. And Aline McNeil, their best defensive tackle, is probably going to be out. He just got hurt. Uh, and then the the Raiders also, uh, not a phenomenal run defense either, especially up the gut. So Broncos, I think they're, you're going to lean into limiting the passing attempts. I think that's what Sean Payton probably does. The, what does that mean for the offseason and everything with Russell Wilson long term? I don't know. We're going to figure it out, I guess, over these final five games. Uh, but I think it's taking the ball more so out of Russell's hands uh, from a drop back perspective. So, like I said, I mean, I know you don't know how it's all yeah. going to play out. But if you were, if you had your magic globe in front of you predicting the future, is Russ the week one starter next year? I would say probably yes right now but it's really hard to say it's just the cap hit is so detrimental it's even to split it from that june 1st uh but if there's any team that could do it it's probably the broncos with the walton penner group being able to buy around the cap a little bit in the dead cap stuff and uh yeah should be a uh should be interesting but i think right now i would say yes but it's probably a 60 40 uh right now as far as where i'm at with a yes versus no it's been such a weird year statistically for him. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think you're going to see this very often in the NFL of a quarterback be so good in the red zone, but so bad everywhere else on the field. And to have a coach that, I mean, it's easy to tell, like he doesn't trust Russ to go out there, throw it 40 times a game and think that they're going to win that game. Like that's just not what's going to happen. And such a departure from such a departure from Drew Brees too, right. Who was asked to just, throw it around a lot of quick pass game stuff, but high volume and Russ breeze was throwing, you know, 50 dropbacks a game kind of stuff. And right now, Wilson, you're like hoping for 25, uh, which is interesting. Dave Glassman coming in saying Nick on NRWOB tomorrow night. Can't wait. Yeah. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, gonna join, uh, of course, guest on a podcast and talk some ball. So we'll see how it goes. They said that I could bring an adult beverage. Uh, so Ooh. I might take them up on that. And, uh, guys, we got to get out of here. Um, I got a virtual class with the, uh, a pregnant uh, lady here. So got to fly Carl Dummler. Make sure you guys are following him on Twitter at Carl Dummler MHH. I'm also on Twitter at Nick Kendall MHH. Also make sure you're following us at BFB football pod for uh, wait, BTB football pod for building the Broncos and at mile high huddle. If you haven't done so yet, join us at facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle and facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle pod. And as the ticker says here underneath, please subscribe to mile high huddle over on YouTube like this channel and share on your social media platform. Good show overall, uh, stock up, stock down. I did I just stock up for me. Broncos defensive line uh, really had a hard time just thinking anybody on the offense deserved to stock up in this one, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll just go the, the defensive front. Good job by them. Hopefully we'll see more of that going forward. Yeah, for me, uh, PJ Locke, Zach Allen, loved both those guys and what they brought to the field. 
stock down course, looking at Russell Wilson there. Uh, unfortunately, just, line. yeah. And, and I'd say my last little stock down, just as I'm getting out of here, a little bit of Sean Payton. Mm. Um, I, there, there's one thing I was very surprised at. Samaj P. Ryan only got one carry in this game. You know, he'd been one of your, I, I'd say he'd been your best running back during this five game stretch. And it seemed like he kind of took a back door in this game um, or back seat this game. And maybe it was just they thought, hey, these are these, this is a team that gives up explosive plays. Maybe we need our more explosive running backs to get in there. But I was just a little bit surprised that they really didn't lean into him at least a little bit more. You're like five carries. Let's give him five carries to go out there and see what he can do. And so mm-hmm. that, that's my my one little tweak there that I just wish just because I've been so impressed with P Ryan lately. Yeah. Yeah, not a uh, not a bad call. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're gonna get on out of here. Have a great rest of your Tuesday night. Make sure you continue to choose kindness and compassion. Michael Ronquillo, great show tonight. Thank you so much, Michael, for the extra super chat here. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Go Broncos. Choose compassion and kindness. Love y'all.